Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my pleasure to chair the delivery of the Patterson Oration uh, to be given by Mr. Terry Moran, the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, I'd like to welcome Mary Patterson, uh, who is married to the late Dr. John Patterson. Uh, John made a major contribution to public life in this country. Um, personally, I knew him um, from the early 1960s, even though I wasn't brought up in Melbourne because he was an outstanding student leader. Uh, in fact, he used to frequently quote uh, John Kennedy's statement that the student leaders of today are the student leaders of tomorrow. And um, he was the uh, president of the SRC at the University of Melbourne. And uh, he was a leading light in the national campaigns in those days to boost education in Australia and to abolish the white Australia policy. Uh, as many of you would know, he was born with diastrophic dwarfism, but he did not let his disability hinder his professional or private life. But it's not because of that that the oration is named in his honour, because he was an outstanding public servant. Beginning in uh, urban planning, uh, then in water, where he played a big role in the introduction of user pay schemes, uh, which paved the way for their spread across Australia. Uh, in Victoria, he reformed the water industry and then introduced major reforms as head of the Community Services Agency. And then with the arrival of Premier Kennett, he, uh, health was added to the portfolio with major reforms, including case mix based funding and later he became Secretary of Infrastructure. <coughs> so John Patterson was an outstanding, very determined, very intelligent, very successful public servant with a grasp of the big picture, a capacity to analyse problems deeply, a unique ability to deal in detail and to implement delivery. Uh, he also had a considerable interest in the early conceptualization of the establishment of ANSOG. And um, today it's very appropriate that uh, Mr. Moran, who of course knew John Patterson well, should be giving this year's Patterson oration. Uh, all Australians here would certainly know all about Terry. Um, he's had a long career in the public sector. Um, I particularly think of his early days in the field of training, heading the State Training Board in Victoria, then uh, the CEO of the Australian National Training Authority, Director General of Education in Queensland, then Secretary of Premier and Cabinet in Victoria, where he played a leading role not only in putting that uh, public service on a very good footing, but in generating major contributions to national policy debates. And then most recently, as Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, <coughs> excuse me, he's also played, as I've said many times, a decisive role in the establishment of ANSOG. More recently, he's contributed to the establishment of the Australian National Institute for Public Policy at ANU. So it's with great pleasure that I invite Terry to give this year's Patterson Oration. Thank you very much, Alan. And I, as I look out uh, to the faces in the audience, I recognise many old friends and I Obviously, there are so many of them that I can't go through them all by name, but it's, it's wonderful to be here with old friends and colleagues more generally. 
And I'm honoured to be delivering this oration, as I, as I, and I thank Alan Fells for his invitation and for that warm welcome. I'm especially honoured to be the first public servant to make this address, and I'm delighted that we're joined by Mary, John's widow. Uh, John Patterson was a reformer. His career ranged widely, as Alan has said. It spanned many of the major policy challenge challenges that we are facing today, water, community services, health, and urban design and planning. John was also an exemplar of the virtuous citizen engaged in shaping our democratic system. At university, he navigated student politics and rose to become president of Melbourne University's Student Representative Council. He worked as a unionist, he joined the academy and became a resident scholar at the Australian National University. Then he began his career uh, as a servant of the public, faithful to the Australian Westminster tradition in serving both sides of politics with intellect and charm, occasional charm, in equal measure. In retirement, he combined a role in shaping economic reform at the Productivity Commission with academic and other duties. And of course, he formulated ideas for a new school of government that anticipated some aspects of the Australian and New Zealand school of government, which honours him with this oration. John espoused a strong emphasis on economics as a basis for public policy work, work, a line of thinking that can be seen today in aspects of the executive masters of public administration. He also was a staunch defender of the requirement to offer, where necessary, confronting policy advice to ministers. He recognised the vital role of the public service in serving democracy and of democracy serving the people. Now, it's an unfashionable issue, but that is what I'd like to talk about today, democracy and us. Democracy has at its heart a simple goal, government by the people. Power and authority rests with citizens, not with a narrow elite. The people's interests are sovereign. The idea is simple, but the practice of democracy has grown and changed over the centuries. Australia's system of parliamentary democracy has its roots in the glorious revolution in Britain in 1688. Democracy looked different in those days. For one thing, the elections themselves were much more arduous and time consuming. Orders to conduct the election were issued and carried to every town in the realm by men on horseback. They were pinned up in prominent places for all to see. After a suitable interview, interval, ballot papers were distributed in a similar way and only then did voting occur. Another big difference was that only one in 10 of the population had the right to vote and their choice was no private matter. The electorate was confined to a small knot of voters who generally uh, obeyed implicitly the orders or preferences of their landlord. It took months to tally the vote and announce the result. In 1901, when Australia went to the polls for the first time as a nation, the telegraph and the railway line had transformed not just elections, but man many other aspects of life. Trains carried ballot papers promptly across the country, while telegrams provided running updates on election results. Yet even with these technological advances, the process was still a drawn out affair. In Sydney, on election night, crowds thronged outside the offices of the Sydney Morning Herald, where a tally board had been erected to display the results. The Prime Minister, Sir Edmund Barton, who had been appointed three months earlier, pending the first election, had, been, uh, uh, had um, set up a residence in a hotel directly across the road from the Herald to monitor the tally board. Even with these facilities, it was more than a week before the outcome was known with confidence. That first Commonwealth election was conducted under state electoral laws, as the Parliament had not yet convened to make any laws of its own. By the time of the next election, in 1903, the vote had been extended to all adult British subjects resident in Australia for six months, although there were exceptions, notably for Indigenous Australians, Asians and Africans, defects that were not fully rectified until 1962. Today, the franchise has been extended to all adult citizens and we have come to expect to vote during the day and know the result before we go to sleep. Today, the process of counting votes 
and transmitting the tele has been vastly accelerated by changes in communications. And last year's delayed outcome occurred in spite of technology. Of course, the, delays, uh, the delay wasn't because of any problem in counting votes and transmitting the result, but because of the political negotiations required to form a government. It may be reassuring that the human dimension of politics at times can trump technological advance, but of course the two forces are bound inextricably together. Democratisation and industrialisation have been among the most crucial forces for change in the modern world. The technological advances brought by the Industrial Revolution have changed democracy in significant ways, and the advent of democracy was itself a key driver of the Industrial Revolution. Democracy came first and contributed to industrialisation. The glorious revolution weakened the power of the monarchy, helping create an affluent middle class. The middle class had influence and interests separate from those of the monarchy and the aristocracy, and its rise led to the greater empowerment of individuals. Industrialisation and democracy together brought improvement in education and drove the growth of the public service. These changes continue to affect the nature and conduct of democracy. We should embrace, not fear, such change while making sure we remain faithful to the overall goal of democracy, government by the people. Australia's democracy is one of the oldest and best in the world. We have our own versions of the institutions and practices that make a democracy. Our liberal democracy is based on democratic institutions of governance, a liberal conception of the rights of individuals and a market-based economy. The institutions of our liberal democracy divide power between levels of government, federal, state and local, and among three branches of government, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. By conventions, there are informal divisions within the executive branch. On the one hand, there are its leaders, the Prime Minister and her ministers, or Premier and ministers at the state and, ter state and territory level, and on the other, the departments of state and various agencies that provide ongoing support to the leadership. The formal institutions of our democracy have not changed greatly since 1901, but the practice of government has. There have been changes in the balance of power between the legislature and the executive, changes in the balance of power between ministers and the Prime Minister, and changes in the balance of power within the policy and administrative arms of the executive, that is, between the cabinet and the public service. The current minority government arrangements have also prompted changes with modified parliamentary procedures and a greater role for private members' business. The biggest change has been in the broader environment that shapes the way our democracy functions, an environment shaped by interest groups, the media, and by society as a whole. A key aspect of this changing, broader environment has been in the ways we communicate within our society. It's not trivial that the conduct of elections and news about politics are transmitted instantly these days by fibre optic cable or satellite, not on horseback, as in the 17th century, nor by telegraph, as in 1901. I'll say more about that shortly, but first I want to discuss the shifts in the balance of power. Over our history, power has been shifting from the legislature to the executive. This has occurred because of changes in practice rather than in the structure of government. The argument is sometimes made that this shift has diminished the separation of powers, but this overlooks the historical origins of our system. The close links between the executive and legislature in Australia originated before federation. The American emphasis on the separation of the executive and the legislature is tempered in Australia by the principle of responsible cabinet government derived from Britain where it evolved in the mid 19th century. The cabinet comes from the legislature, but its function is to rule the nation. As Walter Badgett wrote in 1867, Cabinet is, and I use his words, a hyphen which joins, a buckle which fastens the legislative part of the state to the executive part of the state. In its origin, it belongs to the one, 
in its functions, it belongs to the other. That's the end of